to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, friends. Welcome to OnScript. This is Amy Brown Hughes, a co-host for the podcast with Matt Lynch, Matt Bates, Aaron Heim, Drew Johnson, and Chris Tilling. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Ivan Satyavrata. After transitioning out of academia uh, of 21 years of theological education, now for 13 years, Ivan serves as the senior pastor of one of the largest churches in North India, a multilingual congregation of eight languages and about 5,000 people in Kolkata, India. He's also the executive director of multiple social justice and outreach ministries operated un- operating under the church's auspices. He's also been a visiting professor at various institutions, including Regent College in Vancouver. I have the pleasure of speaking with Ivan today in person because he and his wife, Sheila, are here at Gordon College. He is a visiting scholar for Gordon Center for Faith and Inquiry. It has been a delight having him on campus, speaking in chapels, giving lectures, and spending time with our students. When I heard he was coming to campus, I recognized his name from an essay he wrote in The Spirit Over the Earth, Pneumatology in the Majority World, published by Erdman's in 2016, and edited by two colleagues that I knew at Wheaton, Jean Green and Steve Pardue. Today, friends, is going to be a treat because I get to talk to a fellow Pentecostal about the Holy Spirit and the intersection of theology and social change. I'm just a little bit excited about this. So we're going to talk about a few examples of Ivan's work today, including his book, The Holy Spirit, Lord and Life Giver, published with InterVarsity Press in 2009, and his most recent book, Pentecostals and the Poor, Reflections from the Indian Context, a collection of lectures given at the Asia Pacific Theological Association and published by Asia Asia Pacific Theological Seminary Press in 2017. Our college has been keeping Ivan very busy, so I'm delighted that we're able to make some time to talk today. So let's get to it. Welcome, Ivan. Hi, Amy. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Wonderful. I want to begin with giving our OnScript listeners a chance to get to know you a bit. Could you start us off today by talking about your journey to becoming a pastor and a theologian? How And also, how do you see those vocations coalescing and perhaps sometimes even sharpening one another? Just the highlights of my journey. Uh, I grew up in the city of Mumbai on the west coast of India. Uh, I was born to a nominal Christian family and uh, until the age of 17 had no real meaningful faith. In fact, uh, I would describe myself as far away from God, uh, tired of life, and uh, really a very morbid and depressing sort of person. And uh, through a convergence of circumstances and through reading a book by Michael Green, uh, you know, simple apologetics, treatment of uh, the life of Christ, uh, I found myself praying and asking Jesus to come into my life as Lord and Savior. That was the beginning of a journey. At that point in time, of course, I had very little, little or no conception of what a full-time Christian ministry involved. And uh, certainly, the thought of that would have made me run the, in the opposite direction. But uh, I was just hungry to understand my faith more and uh, ended up, again, through a series of circumstances, uh, going to Southern Asia Bible College in Bangalore, which was the Assemblies of God College for the region. Spent four years there for my undergraduate work. Came back to Mumbai and uh, thought I would spend the rest of my life as a street evangelist who worked the slums. And that was my passion, my burden. And never anticipated going beyond an undergraduate study program. But as time went on, uh, my mentor at Southern Asia Bible College, who was also my theology professor, Dr. John Higgins, invited me back to join the faculty. Uh, Incidentally, I also met my wife, who was the daughter of uh, one of my professors there, Elizabeth, who we know better as Sheila. Uh, Went back there, uh, but in preparation for being there, uh, did an MDiv degree in uh, Union Biblical Seminary. Actually, it's in India, it's known as the Bachelor of Divinity. 
where I had the privilege of studying under some great professors, including Chris Wright uh, and others, F.F. F. Bruce, uh, uh, Prodigy, uh, Brian Wintle, and some excellent scholars. I came back to ba Bangalore, served on the faculty for 21 years, and in the course of my time at SABC, had the privilege of spending a year and a half at Regent College of Vancouver, Canada, uh, for a THM degree. And again, had the privilege of uh, working under Jim Packer, uh, doing courses under Gordon Fee and some other great scholars. All of that to illustrate uh, the richness of uh, what we have received in the course of our journey. In uh, 2006, uh, I was serving as president in Southern Asia Bible College. Uh, after having, uh, you know, done a PhD, a research-based PhD through the Oxford Center of Mission Studies. Interestingly, my PhD field of study was uh, the uh, the climax of a search that began when I was a street preacher on the streets of Mumbai. Mm -hmm. How to bridge the gap uh, bit with people of other faiths. Uh, how can I meaningfully present the gospel to them? And so I did my work on something called fulfillment theology. Uh, did my work under a, a fine Roman Catholic uh, conservative scholar named you know, Gavin de Costa. Uh, was examined by Dr. Julius Lipner from Cambridge Divinity School. Uh, and I thought I had uh, been full-time academics for the rest of my life. But that's when God stirred up our nest. And uh, mm -hmm. after serving uh, eight years as president of Southern Asia Bible College, moved up to the city of Calcutta to a very interesting church and mission, the Assembly of God Church there, which was founded by Mark and Halda Buntain, a well-known names actually within the within the Assemblies of God circles, and was the first national pastor. So my wife and I uh, have had the privilege of leading that congregation as well as heading the ministries there, the impact of which extends to, throughout East India for the last 13 years. And uh, here's where we are now in our journey. Thank you. I, uh, I just have thought it had been so interesting to listen to you talk so, so seamlessly of bringing um, all that experience that you had as an academic and, and all of these experiences really around the world, and then being a pastor and, and seeing that transition happen. And it's kind of funny that it went from sort of a street evangelist to academic, but and then back into evangelism, but sort of in a larger church context. Um, and just to give our listeners a bit of a landscape of Christianity in India, last night at dinner, uh, you spent a bit of time explaining kind of Christianity in India, uh, past and present. I know it's a huge subject, so I'm not going to ask you for a dissertation on that by any means. But would you mind giving our listeners a bit of background about um, sort of uh, you, you were talking last night about like uh, Thomas and the third century, and then and then up until today? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, there's a, a strong tradition that Saint Thomas brought. Christianity to, to India in the first century. And uh, there was a church in South India called the St. Thomas Church, which actually uh, claimed to be the living testimony to the fact that St. Thomas uh, brought Christianity to India. While we don't have hard archaeological evidence to, uh, to confirm that, there's uh, no doubt whatsoever that uh, Christianity has been in India from as early as the third century AD. Uh, there was active trade between the Middle East and the southern uh, part of India. And Syrian traders moved back and forth, and many of them were Christians and brought, uh, at least f without any question, there's evidence of Christianity being then in India from the 3rd century onwards. However, uh, there's almost a um, silence in terms of any missionary engagement with the rest of India for s several centuries. The next high point of Christianity's impact upon India was in 1498 when Vasco da Gama mm -hmm. uh, came to the west coast of India, to Goa, 
and that re represents the advent of Roman Catholicism in India. Uh, the next high point, of course, would be the early 18th century, 1706, when the first Protestant missionaries, two German missionaries financed by the King of Denmark, brought Christianity to the southern part of India. Uh, Bartholomew Ziegenwald was the German who translated the first portion of scripture in any Indian language in Tamil in early 1800. Uh, of course, the next high point would be William Carey's uh, coming to the region of Calcutta, the wider region of Calcutta in 1793. Those are the key phases of Christianity coming to India. And of course, uh, by the time of the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, you know, where the peak of modern missions, you had American, Canadian, British, and all uh, forms of European uh, missions having their presence in India. And it was only in 1947, soon after India got independence, that many of these missions allowed themselves to be subsumed under uh, uh, church unification movements, the Church of North India and the Church of South India. What I have not brought into this description is, of course, the free churches which came subsequently, including various Pentecostal movements as well. So India today uh, represents a wide diversity of Christian expressions. Um, However, when it comes to the actual impact, uh, statistics, uh, census statistics place uh, in the percentage of Christian, Christians in India at 2.3%, which is small, but considering the population, it's a significant uh, number. Um, most church growth experts would place the actual uh, presence of India as being much more significant than that, uh, both in terms of uh, those who confess Christ as Lord and Savior may not have been included in the census. And that doesn't include, of course, uh, the wider impact of Christianity through institutions, particularly sc Christian schools, colleges, and even Christian medical missions. So the circle of impact perhaps grows much wider. Nevertheless, for a tradition that is at least 1,700 years old, the impact of the gospel in India has been uh, relatively uh, low. Although the gen we have been privileged in our generation to see a uh, considerable impact in the last generation, at least. You've talked a little bit over the last few days about colonization and how. what role did that play in kind of Indian Christianity, in the sense of like the version of British version of Christianity and Indian version of Christianity, um, because there's several other you know, uh, countries around the world with you know experiencing like, okay, what does it look like to be Christian, but not that like the kind of Christian that we were told to be? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, that's that's an interesting question. One that I'm happy to respond to because uh, I think looking back, obviously you can't do much about what has happened in the past, but one always wonders what would it have been like if uh, Christianity had come to India separate from uh, the colonial enterprise. And I say that because as we all know, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, colonial expansion had the strong endorsement of the Roman Catholic Church, and they were asked, wherever they went, the colonizers were asked to spread the Roman Catholic faith. And so you have the first level of impact on the west coast of India where uh, uh, the Portuguese military accompanied the padres wherever they went, and uh, many uh, Indians were forced to be baptized under threat of death. That's the first level of conversion. The Protestant mission, on the other hand, uh, bears a mixed testimony. On one hand, uh, the British 
who, as you know, colonized India and occupied much of what is today. Uh, British India, of course, extended beyond what is today described as India to what is today Pakistan, Bangladesh, and even Sri Lanka. But uh, they were in India mainly for commercial interests. However, there were occasions when, such as when churches were started in India uh, for the military, uh, Christianity was clearly seen as the religion of the oppressors. Mm. And you would see, for instance, uh, you know, the military officers go to church on Sunday, uh, fulfill their ritual, and then come out and live what would we would t today regard as uh, uh, far from the Christian lifestyle. So the impression of Christianity that, uh, you know, our ancestors in India would have had is more the cultural Christianity. For them, Christianity meant that you eat meat. It meant that you drink alcohol. It meant that your morals are relatively uh, promiscuous. And so in contrast to the Hindu and Muslim religious cultures, which are much more conservative. And so even until today, we carry that colonial baggage. So when you look at the average Bollywood movie, uh, if there's somebody with a Christian name, if he's a guy with the name John or Anthony, he's probably a drunkard. Mm. And if she's Mary or uh, Sharon, a Christian sounding name, she would probably be a woman of low morals. Mm. That's the caricature of, of Christianity. And so in subsequent years, when evangelical Christianity and Pentecostal Christianity came to India, uh, the baggage that we have continued to carry to date is that this is a Western religion. It's a vestige of Western colonialism. Some today in uh, uh, conservative fundamentalist Hindu circles would even call it a form of neocolonialism mm -hmm. and see this, you know, our Christian enterprise as a subset of the colonial enterprise. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, Amy. No, that was but, great. Yeah. That was great. To, to that extent, it, we've struggled to separate the Christian gospel mandate from the colonial, uh, let's say, civilizational mandate, if I can use that term. If you remember, you know, the European uh, white man's burden, where they equated uh, the spread of European civilization with Christianization. Mm -hmm. And so that is to date uh, something of a problem for us when we try to communicate Christ to our people. So what are, maybe spinning a little bit more on the constructive, positive end, right? What are some of the current discussions happening in Indian theology that you find particularly interesting right now? We're going to talk about pneumatology here in a moment, but I'm curious about other current discussions that are happening. You know, quite frankly, uh, I'm not, uh, I've been out of the loop in terms of, uh, I haven't been to a theological symposium for some time now. However, I think what is at the moment, uh, what has been and continues to be a pressing issue for India is first and foremost the issue of Christ Indian Christian identity. Mm. What exactly does it mean? Mm. Uh, especially in the day and age in which we live, where increasingly the rise of cultural nationalism uh, would seek to identify Indianness uh, with a Hindu identity. What does it mean to be Indian and Christian? While this has been a, a critical issue from the time of independence, uh, I think more so now because the pressure from uh, the wider community is uh, to conform and to to some extent subsume our Christian identity to a wider defini definition of of what it means to be Indian, uh, uh, and uh, the pressure would be to conform uh, to a greater Hinduness than uh, uh, Indianness. 
Whereas our forefathers, uh, uh, the freedom fighters, for instance, those who, who were pioneers of uh, the modern India, actually believed in defining India uh, in most secular terms and creating space for people of all faiths uh, to be equally Indian. If anything, uh, the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, felt minorities such as Muslims and, and Christians uh, should be actually given more space so that they feel secure in a Hindu-majority country. That is certainly uh, one of the biggest issues today, I think, that every Christian is facing. Closely allied to that is, of course, uh, the Dalit identity. Uh, Dalits, as you know, is the name that is given to those who traditionally were outcasts outside the Hindu uh, social structure. Uh, and as it happened, uh, it was from th that community of people that the maximum number of conversions to Christianity have happened over the last century. Because those who were disempowered, rejected by mainstream Hindu uh, community, found the presentation of the gospel attractive and, of course, empowering. Many of them have got educated through Christian institutions and actually have found an ident identity that is uh, 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 gives them some uh, status and recognition in society. And so that's the other area where there's a considerable amount of the theologizing going on, where Dalit Christians particularly are at the forefront of uh, uh, demanding uh, uh, more space for Dalits and uh, a wider Dalit identity. It goes beyond just the Dalit Christian identity. So let's shift to uh, discussions of your books for a little bit. Uh, your book, Holy Spirit, Lord and Life Giver, is uh, an accessible introduction to the Holy Spirit. I really enjoyed how it was laid out. Um, and especially enriched by various stories from your experience as a pastor, as a professor, just daily life, like talking about running into people on the train and having conversations. What do you say to those who are suspicious or perhaps just nervous about acknowledging the work of the Holy Spirit in, in, in the lives of individuals and communities? Sure. Just by way of uh, clarification, the Global Christian Library series to which my book on the Holy Spirit was a contribution uh, uh, was intentionally uh, structured to be in a narrative form. So it was, it was uh, not just my preferred style as much as something that's required of the uh, the, the entire series. Uh, and I definitely enjoyed uh, uh, putting it in the format that I did. For those who were nervous about the Holy Spirit, uh, the day and age in which we live. Uh, when one looks back upon the last century, uh, I think it's uh, it's hard to, any, to be suspicious anymore about the activity of the Holy Spirit. I think uh, if there was a time when people would necessarily be nervous, suspicious, I think today the Pentecostal movement as a whole has demonstrated on one hand uh, its credentials as an effective means of bringing health and nourishment revival to the church. More importantly, in terms of missional impact globally. Uh, for instance, in India today, uh, while as elsewhere in the world, the Pentecostal movement is growing rapidly, its real impact I think, is to be measured not just in the growth of uh, those who identify themselves as Pentecostal or those who attend Pentecostal churches, and the numbers are huge and growing. But when you look at other movements which are not, uh, would not identify themselves as Pentecostal, the charismatic or Pentecostal type of worship, the type of experience, for instance, it's very rare now that you find anyone in any mission agency, uh, which, by the way, uh, mission agencies in India, 
the growth of mission agencies, indigenous mission agencies in India is a very significant development of the last 50 years in India. And uh, maybe only one or two of them would e e describe themselves as Pentecostal. Most of the others wouldn't. But uh, almost every one of those organizations, uh, you would have uh, their personnel giving you stories of healing, praying for the sick, uh, of uh, what we describe as you know a presence of charismata among their converts. Uh, it's very common in India now, whether Pentecostal or non-charismatic circles, for people to recognize the reality of the demonic and uh, what earlier used to be uh, in many ways only a characteristic of Pentecostal churches, you know, where you have uh, uh, exorcism, demons being cast out, is now very much a passe. It's uh, normal to uh, even churches which may not describe themselves as Pentecostal charismatic. So to, to that extent, I think in a healthy sort of way, there has been a permeating of uh, the healthy aspects of the Pentecostal movement into different uh, expressions of the church. I'm speaking, of, of course, of India primarily. I'm not, can't comment on outside of India. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and maybe jumping off of that a little bit, um, you, I really enjoyed your essay and the piece I mentioned earlier, The Spirit Over the Earth, New Mythology in the Majority World. In that essay, you talk about the personhood of the Holy Spirit in Indian Christian thought. And I really appreciated how you outlined Christian and Hindu conceptions of spirit, as well as how pneumatology has developed in dialogue with specific traditions. Would you unpack some of those observations there I mean, in general, just to give people a sense of, of that conversation about the personhood of the spirit? Well, I think not just... Uh, not just with the advent of the modern Pentecostal movement, but I think globally there is certainly a greater s awareness, sensitivity to spirituality. Uh, even here in the West, for instance, with the spread of uh, New Age and so on and so forth, there's an openness to the supernatural. There's an openness to things of the spirit that I think is uh, perhaps unprecedented in the recent past. And... Uh, while I, I think that's, uh, in general, a healthy trend, uh, I think what I try to do in that article is, of course, much of that is due to the impact of Eastern mysticism on the West. Uh, I think uh, for the, you know, the West perhaps after in the post post uh, war era, after having uh, swung too far towards materialism, perhaps the pendulum was swinging back a little bit towards openness to uh, spirituality. And while I think in principle that's a healthy movement uh, and an opportunity, I think the danger is that in the over-eagerness to embrace the spiritual, uh, there is the danger both within the church as well as in the in the broader culture to embrace uh, what I think I define in that article as a pneumatomonism. Uh, pneumatomonism is perhaps what a Christian description of, uh, in broad strokes, of uh, spirituality in Hinduism. Hinduism is deeply spiritual, uh, and Eastern mysticism, of course, is uh, grounded in in uh, uh, in an understanding of the word, excuse me, of the world as essentially spiritual. In fact, uh, the highest level of Hindu philosophy would say the only reality in the universe is spirit. The visible world as we see today, tangible world, is maya, is illusion. Now, the problem with that is uh, the concept of spirit in Hinduism, in Eastern mysticism in general, is abstract, impersonal. 
uh, uh, corresponding with a neoplatonic ground of being. And the danger, I think, is if Christian reflections on the Holy Spirit, Pentecostal or otherwise, uh, in their eagerness to buy into the opportunity that openness to spirituality today in the Western world provides, fail to realize that there's a huge gulf between the Christian understanding of spirit and the dominant understanding of spirit in the in the Eastern world. For instance, in Hinduism, the uh, concept of spirit, the overarching ultimate reality is Brahman. Now, Brahman is defined in negative terms in, uh, in uh, uh, Advaitic monism. It's neither this nor that. It's undifferentiated being. And of course, what is crucial in that description is that Brahman is neither personal nor impersonal, neither good nor evil. And uh, that has huge ethical and moral impact. When you fail to recognize this, this gulf of difference between the Christian understanding of spirit and the Hindu understanding of spirit, the Christian understanding of spirit is first and foremost grounded in the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, which in turn is derived from our, our conviction concerning uh, the incarnation in which God the Son became flesh and dwelt among us. Our conception of God is not just personal, it is tripersonal. And it's on the uh, and based on our, our conception of the Trinity flows the Christian ethic of love, of prayer, uh, devotion to God, worship. It all makes sense, it all has meaning because we believe God is just not just a person, he's tripersonal. Now when you substitute that or allow notion of spirit that is abstract, impersonal, uh, and uh, immoral, the consequences can be disastrous for uh, our experience of the Holy Spirit. And, I, and in Roman Catholic, uh, some recent Roman Catholic reflections on spirituality, as well as some tendencies even in some Pentecostal circles, uh, there is a danger that we will inadvertently find ourselves sliding into a spirituality that is closer to the East and uh, the, the un understanding of spirit as impersonal power mm -hmm. rather than tripersonal being. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to address in my article to, to point out the dangers and point out how we need to be make sure that our conception of spirit is firmly grounded in uh, Christocentric Trinitarianism. Right. You also draw um, a bit on... Uh maybe a less large uh, understanding of spirit. Um, in Hinduism, bhakti, was it? That, shakti. Uh, shakti. Um, that uh, you saw as having a little bit more... Um, Sorry, I, I beg your pardon. I think you're talking about the tradition of bhakti. Yes. Bhakti, bhakti. Yeah. you're right. Yeah. So of where there's a little bit more like personal. Like, yeah. So there's a sense of it's a maybe a minority tradition in Hinduism, but like of of a personal spirit and you kind of draw on that a little bit and talk a little bit about would you share a little bit about some of the engagement um that you saw with some theologians there and yeah sure bhakti is actually a reform movement within hinduism mm -hmm. uh, uh one of the giants in in uh, the hindu tradition was a figure named shankaracharya who popularized uh what is until today perhaps the most influential uh, strand of Hinduism, which is the Advaitic monistic strand. Uh, and so far, all that I've described is, is with, re with reference to the Advaitic monistic strand. Obviously, that is not satisfying. 
And so within Hinduism, they developed a reform movement of those who wanted to worship God in as in his personal aspects. And uh, while Shankaracharya's Advaitic monism uh, uh, emphasized God as impersonal, uh, abstract uh, 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 ground of being, he did make allowance uh, for a for for this impersonal uh, aspect of God as manifesting himself mm. as a lower form of personal being. Uh, so Shankaracharya, in a sense, accommodated his his uh, epistemology to what he felt were the masses who needed a conception of God as personal to connect to. But that became popularized into what has become known as the Bhakti movement. Incidentally, the version of that that you still see in the West is the Hare Krishna movement. That's a, that's a spin-off of the Bhakti movement in which God is viewed in, in personalist terms. And of course, there are different uh, strands of the Bhakti movement. There are different sects within the Bhakti movement. And in fact, uh, some would even describe uh, the Sikh religion as uh, being in in a, a spin-off of the Bhakti movement because uh, you'll, you'll find there's, there's notions, uh, aspects of the Sikh movement uh, which owe allegiance to the impact of Bhakti. So the Bhakti movement has a concept of God as personal. Bhakti movement has a conception of grace. The Bhakti movement, you'll find followers of the Bhakti movement, uh, uh, you know, worshipping the deity in in uh, in a style very similar to Pentecostal worship. Mm. Which is why uh, there have been some uh, figures within Hinduism, uh, there were at least two well-known figures that I have personally studied, dealt with, one of whom I think I mentioned in that article, Sundar Singh, who, whose uh, bhakti orientation actually seems to have created in their hearts a hunger for God, which they find they found fulfilled uh, in Christ when they first received the message of the uh, gospel of Christ. Another well-known figure uh, who would identify himself, who actually said, I don't refer to him specifically in, in that article, but who actually said, I came to Christ on the bridge of Tukaram. Tukaram being one of the Bhakti poet saints. Uh, the name of this famous Christian is Naran Maman Tilak, who in fact went on to write many songs and be, was a leader of uh, uh, the church uh, in and around the Bombay area in Maharashtra. Very well-known uh, Christian leader. Uh, so, in fact, I actually suspect the reason the Pentecostal movement has uh, been so successful in India and drawn so many followers is because uh, the Bhakti movement is a movement that is very popular among the masses. And uh, a person who is who is uh, worships God within the Bhakti stream very naturally, easily uh, is attracted to Pentecostal worship mm. and that particular expression of the church in India. So interesting. Well, let's move into your most recent book, um, Pentecostals and the Poor Reflections from the Indian Context. Um, ask you a couple questions uh, from this because uh, I, I was really, I was particularly struck by your reflection on the traditioning process of Pentecostalism. That's the word you use, and how you talk about this as an urgent necessity. You say that uh, this is a quote. A failure to do so, this uh, traditioning process, in a timely manner could result in the emergence of inauthentic and inadequate depictions of the Pentecostal tradition that fail to fairly represent its roots and distinctives. Um, you call this uh, like a global task. So would you speak to what goes into this traditioning process or maybe what you hope to see and what needs to be done? Because I, I have a sense... Uh, I have a personal, a slightly personal stake in this because growing up um, 
in the Assemblies of God Church and then moving to like a larger charismatic sort of uh, non-denominational version. I I went to a very, it was a very large church. And when I got to college, I went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, which is a uh, definitely more on the Pentecostal end of the spectrum. And I had thought that I had a pretty good handle on what my tradition was until I got to college and realized I had no idea. <laughs> that I got there and went, oh, there's a lot of people here that I didn't realize were part of my family, that I didn't understand, I didn't know. And I realized just how I mean, it was I grew. I loved growing up in the tradition, but it was it really lacked a lot of roots. And I spent a good amount of my undergraduate time learning my own tradition again, in a lot of ways, and understanding how it connected with the broader story of the church. And so, I, I when when I read this in there, I thought, oh wow, it's not just a problem here, <laughs> uh, but this seems to be a larger issue in Pentecostalism. So, if you wouldn't mind speaking to some of that, sure. And I sure hope, Amy, you go. Uh, forward in that and uh, actually do some work on helping us all to, to tradition Pentecost. I think what I guess what I had in mind was uh, I guess Pentecost today or Pentecostal today has become uh, something like the word Christian. Mm. Uh, it can mean anything depending on what you want to put it, uh, put into that term. And of course, I'm not talking about trying to sort of uh, define the Pentecostal tradition in fundamentalist terms necessarily, narrowly, as much as uh, capturing uh, some of the richness of what the Pentecostal revival brought to the church at large. Uh, or for instance, you know, uh, one big one, as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, I... Uh, uh, well, Martin Luther, in theory, talked about the preacher of all believers. In actuality, I think it was only the Pentecostal revival of the t uh, 20th century where the Holy Spirit became available to all people everywhere that the preacher of all believers became potentially something the church could uh, actually live out. And yet, sadly... Uh, you will see within a lot of Pentecostal denominations uh, the inertia towards becoming like the older denominations with a deep clergy laity divide. To me, that goes against the tradition of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Uh, two, very early in the Pentecostal tradition, you know, there was this thing, I think I quote that line about uh, its impact on racism, yeah. you know, the blood washes out color. Mm. And yet in subsequent years, because that was not captured in a tradition, you know, we've wasted so many decades, uh, uh, you know, drifting away from what I believe the Holy Spirit was trying to lead us to. A third area, I'm almost embarrassed to speak to it, but I think I must. You know, when you look at the early days of Pentecost, what it brought was I mean, over a century ago, it was a Greek gender equalizer. Yes. Uh, someone, I wish I had a statistic easily available, but someone told me there was a time when 80% of the Pentecostal missionary force were women. And uh, uh, there was no issues, you know, like uh, Amy... Semple McPherson, no issues, Catholic women with women, excuse me, alongside men. In some cases, men allowing women to lead in ministry. And today, I mean, it's ridiculous. I know there are assemblies of God ch churches which are struggling with the issue of women in ministry. And I'm saying, oh, 100 years after God made his will clear, uh, we seem to be regressing. There is, I, and I, I've, I've wondered about that myself because I've noticed a sense of, and I, I'd have, this is very off the cuff, but sort of the sense of how Pentecostalism has sort of structured itself in the sense of, and I, don't, and I think it depends on the context in what country it's in and all that kind of stuff, but there, sen there t does tend to be this like 
sense of maybe out of survival, maybe out of um, just <laughs> the fallen human nature that to dominate and to sort of take power for oneself. I think there's a sense where Pentecostalism does have this significant counterbalance of the power of the Holy Spirit, identifying that specifically over and against the tendency of power that we would bring to the table. But it's like we've stopped listening to the Holy Spirit, <laughs> uh, which seems very counterproductive for a, a tradition that has had that. Absolutely. And you can see that in many areas. For instance, you know, I'm not a crazy fan uh, about people uh, falling under the power and all of that. On the other hand, uh, today, uh, it's almost like the way some people react to that phenomenon. It's, it's like you know, it's something sinful. Whereas when you go back to the early days of Pentecost, that was normal. People didn't question. Of course, the big question to uh, to ensure is no matter how hard you fall, whether you walk straight when you, you stand up again. But, uh, you know, I have friends who are not Pentecostals, you know, asking me about it. He said, how come this is so controversial? You know, I thought you all Pentecostals should be open to that sort of thing. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so to come back, I mean, for me, the, the women, women, ministry of women is a big issue. Uh, so in the absence of proper traditioning, what is happening is that we are like in searching for identity, a tradition of our own, are latching onto a derived identity. For instance, I think probably one stream of the reform school is pulling hard against, uh, you know, trying to bring respect to, uh, sort of exegetical respectability to some ranks of Pentecostalism in the, in the uh, in t in sort of bringing them to a place where, uh, you know, uh, women's ministry is uh, in some way subjugated mm -hmm. to. Uh, I think a dated understanding of of uh, what women, the role women should play in ministry, uh, and it's certainly not a Pentecostal understanding, according to me. But it's now been engrafted into Pentecostal practice because we have, I think, fallen short in our own traditioning process. Yeah, and I know there's some Pentecostals that are that are doing some of that work, um, and. But at the same time, there's a pretty, uh, a pretty heavy streak of anti-intellectualism there, too, that can kind of counteract that, which is the like the the obverse of the sort of the negative version of like Pentecostalism being very open, very non elitist. Like, yeah, you don't have to, you know, have read everything in the world in order to come here and have a Holy Spirit speak through you. But there does seem to be. Um, some suspicions of of um, bringing some theological sort of laying some things down <laughs> and saying, no, this is who we are. Um, so I want to ask one other question. I think it's slightly related. Is uh, you talk in that book about um, the tradition of social engagement. And I think that is one area of I mean, there's a lot of areas where I think Pentecostalism could be very constructive uh, in the world at large. But the, another area of where I see some necessity for this traditioning is having um, that having how to do social engagement, like a social ethic, social awareness. So would you give some background to your discussion on Pentecostal engagement with social issues at large and maybe even share some of what you all do, um, specifically your church and how you sort of see that connect, um, maybe to help us understand how Pentecostalism ended up in this predicament where we've kind of <laughs> shifted away from something that has been pretty significant. Yeah, I I think in, uh, in, in many of these areas, if you'll allow me uh, a little bit of speculation, I actually think left to itself, the spirit, a genuine move of the spirit actually had brought significant correctives to some of the 
weaknesses of the church as you know preceding modern pentecost for instance in the in the movement towards uh removing apartheid anti racism in the movement towards gender equality in the movement towards removing uh, a deep gulf between the clergy and the laity in the movement towards holism uh, an understanding of mission uh, as mission to the whole person integral mission i think many of these if we look at the early stage of pentecost uh uh there was a, definitely an inertia in that direction but i think be, because perhaps i think in the next generation because the first generation of pentecostals uh, did uh were theologically literate you know uh but didn't i'm afraid do enough theologizing and perhaps it wasn't appropriate at that time but you had another generation of pentecostal leaders who who were anti intellectual and as a reaction to that in the absence of theological literacy did a lot of borrowing when it came to theologizing for instance uh you know those scofield reference bible a lot of pentecostals went the dispensational way and for decades did not realize it actually is counterproductive <laughs> to a heart of pentecost and then i so think true. when it comes to women in ministry uh we went to uh fundamentalist exegesis and uh, uh, uh you know imported that into the pentecostal theology when it came to even though in the early stages of pentecost intuitively led by the spirit we would help the poor all of a sudden you know evangelical fundamentalist issues the the reaction to the social gospel became co-opted into the pentecostal agenda so i think that's unfortunate but when we look at if i could dare to suggest the purest tradition within pentecost uh, pentecostals have always when they are spontaneously uh led by the spirit have responded to need yeah. and uh i can speak for uh the mission and church that i'm shila and i are presently privileged to lead uh our founder um dr mark bantain and his wife halda bantain they came to india as evangelists in fact they came on a temporary assignment and uh, mrs Bun- sister bantain who is still alive today very much alive jokes and says you know they sent us on a temporary assignment and uh, even though she doesn't live in calcutta now visits calcutta now and then says we are still waiting for she's still waiting for the replacement to come uh anyway that's a that is that's an aside but uh they came as evangelists and all he did in the first uh, phase of his ministry is have old fashioned tent meetings he uh you know he did not come prepared with a social agenda but i think the turning point came when one day uh, the a beggar at the back of the church in the midst of uh Marx preaching said preacher first fill our bellies and de- then tell us about a god who loves us mm-hmm. and that pierced marx's heart and he realized the incongruity of trying to lead a person to christ and tell them to repent from their sin when they were struggling to make make both ends meet and so uh the social outreach in in calcutta which uh uh continues to to this day uh began with a reflex response to need it didn't begin with a, a well thought out uh you know social theology as such mark bandin saw people who uh, who were refugees hungry dying on the street to some extent also inspired by the work of mother teresa and they worked side by side began a feeding program for people who were dying of hunger then he saw little children running on the streets getting into trouble he said these kids need to be in school but no established school will take them so he started schools for the poor and of course to support the schools for the poor he needed uh, to have a start a child sponsorship program and then of course the schools expanded and uh, of course within the schools for the poor they would feed uh, children 
uh, and then subsequently, of course, uh, they realized that uh, feeding program is good, but it's a black hole. You're not empowering the poor. You need to, to alongside feeding the poor and educating them, you need to help them to uh, you need, uh, to help themselves. And so uh, we started a vocational training center, which provides employment skills and uh, short-term modular courses at the end of which the poor are able to go and uh, make a living, uh, earn uh, for themselves and pull their entire families out of the poverty cycle. Uh, so as time has gone by, of course, uh, and as, uh, as uh, uh, more sophistication has come, more reflection has come to our engagement of poverty, it's now a it's not just action, it's, it's action reflection. We uh, give thought to how we are engaging the issue uh, of poverty without in any way compromising a commitment to proclamation. So it, it one naturally flows out of the other. Uh, and in many occasions, the right hand doesn't know and is not involved with what the left hand is doing. It's part of our overall credibility in a country like India. So we do not do uh, uh, good deeds to attract the poor. We don't offer them uh, food or education as inducements for conversion. Mm -hmm. But what it does do is those who, people of other faiths who see what we do want to come and ask us, why do you do what you do? Why are you engaged in rescuing children from the red light district. They are not your children. Why are you so concerned about them? Why are you concerned about feeding people on the streets? And then we have a chance to tell them, well, we do this because this is the God we serve. This is the God he loves. And uh, uh, he did more than that. He died for our sins. And uh, why don't you come and be part of this movement of change? Mm -hmm. We want to see uh, uh, the world transformed. We want to see hungry children fed. We want, to, we want to have more people come alongside us and help us uh, in this uh, movement of change. And it's without uh, any apology, a Jesus-centered movement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, I'm going to transition us to our speed round now. I'm just going to ask you a few questions, just real quick answers, um, right off the top of your head. Are you a morning or a night person? Night. Night. Oh, yes. I'm a morning person, <laughs> but that's oh, I'm okay. I'm envious of morning persons. <laughs> what superpower do you wish you had? I wish I had access to tons of money, <laughs> then I wouldn't have to stress so over how I could fund so many of our programs. <laughs> What's the most significant book that you know, theological book that you've read in the last fifty years? Oh, wow, that's a big one. Or that you've seen <laughs> yeah, in the last... Probably yeah. Mission of God, Chris Wright, his, his magnum opus, if you can call it that, which he interprets the whole Bible uh, missionally. Mm. Do you have any unusual phobias? None, none that I can think of. Uh, but in terms of a weakness, I tend towards OCD. Mm. So if I see a picture in your study, which is slightly not aligned. <laughs> I have this irresistible urge to straighten it to or straighten a table. It. Right. When, but when otherwise, we, no, no serious When topic. we finish our podcast, you can fix one of my, no. <laughs> one of no, my degrees that might be slightly <laughs> off. <laughs> what is the strangest or weirdest question a student or a member of your congregation has asked you? Well, I don't know if you can call it strange, but a question that is often asked is, uh, because I, we have so many people uh, of other faiths who are coming to Christ, and the common question is, uh, Pastor, my father and my mother never had a chance to hear the gospel. Will they be in heaven? Oh. Yeah. Will they be in heaven or hell? Mm. What is one place in the world you've never been but you would love to visit? Probably Australia. Oh. Yeah, I've never been Australia there. Australia is lovely. Never I'm, been there. Oh, yeah, you should go visit. <laughs> It's lovely there. Um, I have a younger son there at the moment, so that's probably part of the reason for my interest, yeah. What is one book you've read that changed your life in some way? 
in addition to Chris Wright's book? Recently or the past? At any time. <laughs> no, of course, for me, turning point in my life came from that little book, Runaway World by Michael Green. Mm. Yeah. But more recently, a book that has impacted me deeply is um, Sam... Uh, Leadership Pain is the title. Leadership Pain? Oh. Sam... Oh, I know him so well. It's just a senior moment I'm having. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. I, yeah. We but, all have Google. We can figure it out. Yeah. No, it's it's Leadership Pain. It's a very powerful book. And then one last question uh, for the speed round. What's one idea in theology that you think needs to die, that people just need to... Uh, and I be candid. Sure. Uh, God's sovereignty and human free will. <laughs> <laughs> that debate. All right. Ooh, I, I'm sure all, a bunch of people are gonna be like, "Ooh, what would he say about that?" But we'll we'll let we'll let uh, we'll let that hang. So just to shift into uh, maybe one last question to really think sort of pastorally about this, especially because you have this lovely section and at the end of your Pentecostals and the poor. Um, book um, about how Pentecostals can participate like in theological education. And you link theological education directly to the church's mandate to make disciples. Um, would you offer a sketch for us of what role <laughs> oh, sorry, what role the Pentecostal tradition can play in theological education, whether it's an academic institution or a church, um, what that might look like? Yeah, I, I think if there's one weakness of theological education uh, in the West, and that has impacted theological education globally because uh, the rest of the world has patterned how we do ministerial training from the West, it would be, I think, perhaps it's overemphasis on the cerebral. Mm. Uh, we've reduced uh, leadership formation to uh, impartation of knowledge, and that to content knowledge. America has done better in adding to that perhaps skills. Um, I think what the Pentecostal tradition may have helped do, and of course sometimes to the to excess in an anti-intellectualism, but I'm talking about you know holding all of these intention. Is bring is restoring the experiential dimension, you know, the mystical dimension, which is also so important uh, in ministerial formation. Uh, to that extent, I think if uh, we can add uh, without sacrificing a commitment to intel intellectual growth, you know, academic growth, and in, in intellectual intellectual integrity we can add the importance of spiritual formation. Uh, and some attention, of course, to uh, the vocational gifting of the Holy Spirit and helping people understand uh, their gifts better, utilization of their gifts better. I think that is something that Pentecost could add to the uh, ministerial training process. So I was thinking about when I was structuring this question too, just thinking about how key transformation is and how to talk about transformation in the sense of discipleship. Because one of the questions I've often heard in churches and just with students and such is um, on like pastoral, like small group levels all the way up through academic conversations is how do you like talk about helping, uh, how do you help people learn what transformation is and then how to like do it. <laughs> We're told to make disciples. And then we have books that have very sort of structured versions of that, that almost that people don't see themselves in often because they tend to be, like you said, very cerebral. Um, and, and other times there's just this sense of, of like 
well, after the conversion experience, the Holy Spirit just sort of randomly helps me in some way. <laughs> There's, it, it, there seems it's either we're overstructuring it or we're completely understructuring it. And there's a sense, there's this real loss there, or maybe uh, just a, a gap there, a lacuna of, of how transformation might look in the Christian life. Um, and I think that Pentecostalism has an opportunity, perhaps there, to help us understand a little bit more about the dialogue of the Holy Spirit and transformation. So how how do you, as as a pastor, or shepherd people through what it means to transform, what it means to become a disciple? I wish I could ask you that myself, <laughs> because in fact, but however, it is a it is a major concern of mine. It's something I struggle with because. I think what you've touched upon is a critical need uh, in the church, and I'll tell you why. It's like you described; it's as though you read my mind. Uh, we have we have uh, made the Christian life a series of events. Mm. You know, you accept Christ uh, of the first event. Two, you get baptized. Three, Pentecostal talk. You know, we talk about the battle of the Holy Spirit. Four another crisis experience, or then you attend church. Uh, and of course, if you want to go further, you go to Bible college, mm-hmm. uh, or you go through a discipleship training program. So it's all about a training program. It's about, uh, you know, uh, another step. Uh, and yet, when you look closely why while there may be some attention to the internal process most of the time we expect like you rightly put it you know what uh, we have called sanctification to happen incidentally on its own and i think if i can just add to your question and you know make a few comments uh I've struggled with this because you. I've often seen people in leadership uh, who are not whole. Mm. They're still, uh, you know, not just broken. We all are broken in a way, but broken to a fault because uh, they've not been sanctified. Mm. And I'm not talking about sanctification in the sense of you know, b- becoming uh, sinless or, you know, how we would understand holiness in the traditional sense as much as they don't seem whole persons, you know, insecure. Uh, a lack of spiritual disciplines as well. Yeah. Like uh, no, no, I'm not even thinking of that. I'm talking about uh, that's different. Yeah. You know, for me, those are important, but they are means to an end. I'm talking about the fruit. Mm. I'm talking about secure leaders, a, a, a leader who is flourishing and nourishing, a leader who it's fun to be around, a leader who you're not afraid of, a leader who doesn't feel threatened, a leader who's non-manipulative. Uh, and I'm saying all that because uh, I don't blame the leadership uh, for coming to a place of power and influence uh, uh, broken. I blame the church. We have failed to understand the true nature of discipleship. Uh, and we have to find a way, unless we believe the gospel, uh, which promises to in- internal change, transformation, unless we believe it doesn't work, we've got to find out what aren't we doing right. Uh, why is it when Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things have passed away, all things have become new. It's not just about that I don't drink or don't smoke anymore, but I'm a different person. What are we not doing right so that people who are broken experience a sense of wholeness along the journey? It's not just a matter of attending church and giving their tithes and singing songs and listening to a message, but there's transformation that's taking place steadily with a person so that truly my brokenness is being repaired along the journey. I guess uh, what has highlighted this for me in, in recent times is uh, we have a couple from Canada who've come to work alongside us. 
who actually wouldn't hesitate to say they had a very broken, difficult past. Both of them come from very difficult past. Both of them were in fact divorced and then married. But their lifetime uh, uh, commitment is to lead people through a wellness program. And I have to say, not only are they great advertisements for it themselves when you meet them, but we find uh, when we f we're finding ourselves sending people to them who need special care, partly because in Calcutta we don't have anything like a Christian psychiatrist, mm. you know. So we we have they are the closest. I all they not they are not trained psychiatrists. They have this wellness program. So it's kind of a health check, and in the process of the spiritual health check, we've noticed people actually coming to wholeness when they go through this 12 step program and uh, we've actually introduced that in our bible college now because i'm saying you know what at least let's do our we can't change uh what is done is done but for those who are coming into christian leadership let's at, at least make sure they have an opportunity at the bible college level to go through this wellness program uh, so that uh, if there's any possibility of any personality uh, lacune being filled with something that needs to be fixed, that's fixable. Uh, and I don't mean that in a permanent, uh, you know, mechanical sort of way, but at least there's an awareness of this is, this is where I lack and this is where I need to grow. That self-awareness, which is a starting point, at least that if they have before they graduate from Bible college, that was going to help them along the way. That, unfortunately, I feel is lacking even amongst m many leaders. I never had anything of that in my own journey. Nobody helped me in that sort of way. Uh, I never answered your question, Amy. I'm sorry. But I, I do believe that uh, as uh, both at the Bible college level, if I can just uh, rewind a bit. While I was in Bangalore in, uh, in education, this was something I already had begun to struggle with. And I challenged the uh, accreditation authorities on this line because they were committed evangelical Christians as well. And I said, you know, uh, shouldn't we... It, it was based on... Uh, it was based on a self-study we did ourselves at SABCB when we, for the first time, uh, not only defined what we were trying to do in terms of the product, we worked backwards and said, if this is what we want, what should we be doing to uh, make sure that's the product? And that had to do not only with academic uh, and ministry components, it had to do with spiritual formation components as well. And so when the accreditation team came after we finished uh, the usual uh, conversations, we challenged them with this uh, because they saw some of the things we were doing and they said, where did you get this from? And we told them. And they decided they would try and go back and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fine-tune the accreditation process to at least bring some of that component mm -hmm. into the process. Now, obviously, these are things which are hard to... Uh, it's dif difficult to have metrics and uh, clear definitions. Yeah. But nevertheless, if there's at least an intentionality... Uh, but, yes, we profess and proclaim a gospel of transformation. And we should be intentionally uh, ensuring we, uh, it's not just an empty promise, it's not just something we claim to be doing, but actually we should be experiencing what we claim the gospel does. And if the systems we have in place, the practices we have in place don't actually deliver, we should be doing you know, much more introspection uh, and change what we need to change in order to be delivering what we believe we should be. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. What a delight it was to talk to you today. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. I hope uh, this was of some use to some of your listeners, but I certainly appreciate the opportunity. 
This is your host, Amy Hughes, with OnScript. We've been enjoying a conversation today with Dr. Ivan Satyavrata, senior pastor of one of the largest churches in North India and theologian. Ivan has written Holy Spirit, Lord and Life Giver, published with IVP in 2009, and Pentecostals and the Poor, published with APST Press in 2017. You can find a link to his books on our website on script.study. Thank you for joining me today, friends. You have been listening to On Script, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just two or five dollars per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study/donate.